right. Thank you, Ms. Nyleen. Well, good morning, beautiful people of uh, Clarksville. How are you doing this morning? Well, it is good to see you. We are so glad that you are here. We appreciate that you brought the sunshine this morning. Uh, we are so glad that you survived yesterday. Uh, we will, during our prayer time tomorrow, of course, be praying for all of those who suffered from the flash flooding that went on yesterday. And, um, but we are glad that we didn't have any damage here in our area um, that we're aware of. So I hope everything was okay at your homes. But we are definitely lifting up uh, what went on there. I just want to introduce myself. My name is Stephen Sauls, and I am the pastor here at Hilldale United Methodist Church. And it's my privilege and honor to welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ to worship this morning. If you happen to be visiting with us, we are so glad that you are here. And we actually like to, to do this one thing when you get to visit with us, which is we want to make a $5 donation in your name. And so there's a little box on your row, or if you go on our website, there's an I'm new heading, not a box, but a pad. And if you give us your email address, we send you one email that lists some charities in our area, and you let us know which one you want us to donate to in your name for the people who are visiting with you, and we'll do that. So take a moment to do that if you wouldn't mind. And whether you're new or not, we always appreciate it when you register your attendance on the pads on your row, and, um, and take a moment to do that. It helps us with our care responsibilities. And for those of you who are joining us at home, we are extremely glad that you are here with us, or if you're on the road traveling and doing whatever. And if you happen to be joining us new online, just comment new in the comment section or send us a message and we'll follow up with you and make the same donation in your name. So thank you for being with us this morning as well. All right, we do have a few announcements we want you to be aware of. Uh, you just heard me mention about the flash flooding. You know that's going on. You've seen on the news, I'm sure, especially in Waverly and in Humphreys County. Um, our ministry here in town that was started by the United Methodist Churches in the area called Urban Ministries that I'm sure you're familiar with and you hear us mention is going to be taking donations donations of uh, non-perishable non items, excuse me, um, you know, words are hard for me, I'm sorry for you guys this morning, but they're going to be taking non-perishable items, yeah, non-perishable items, and we can drop them off between 8 and noon all this week, so if it's diapers or clothes or food items that you can take, whatever it may be, they're going to be pulling together as much as they can, so if you would like to take it and drop it by, if you bring some by the church, we'll help make sure that it gets down to Urban Ministries, but it'd be great if you could take it there. They said they'll be open and taking donations between 8 and noon, so just know that that's going on as well. We do have a few events here going on at the church that we want you to know that's what's happening. Today we're going to have a game day this afternoon at 3 o'clock. We would love for you to come and to play. We're going to have pickleball and tailgate games and all kinds of fun stuff going on here at the church, 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock tonight for all ages. It's just a fun time for us as a church family to get together, to enjoy some socializing and to hang out. So today at 3 o'clock, we'd love for you to come back and be a part of that as well. Now, our big day, our uh, tailgate Sunday, our Back to Church Sunday is going to be on September the 19th. And so we want you to go ahead and mark your calendars and plan on being back. And we want you to look around and find the people who haven't been back to church that you haven't seen from Sunday school or whatever it is. Reach out to them, connect with them, see how they're doing, and invite them back to church on September the 19th or any Sunday. But that Sunday, we're going to go out here after church. We're going to grill out. We're going to have inflatables. We're going to have the train for the kids. We're going to have music. It's going to be a lot of fun together, and we're going to have kind of a tailgate Sunday. And that morning, if you want to wear your, uh, your favorite jersey, we'll, we'll make sure to have some fun games along with that as well. But that's on September the 19th. Mark your calendars. We would love for everybody to plan to be here, and let's make it a great day. Uh, we do have one other announcement. Next Sunday, we are going to be celebrating Miss Kim's last day as our direct, Director of Children's and Christian Education. We are sorry to see her transition from staff to lady, but we're excited about this new chapter and opportunity in her life. But what we would like for you to do is to write Miss Kim some letters. We want you to let her know a time she's impacted your life, something that's going on, and we're going to be collecting them here at the church to give to her. You can drop them on the credenza out here in the, uh, in the narthex. Those are two words that I really didn't know until I was Methodist. Uh, narthex, it's just a foyer or a foyer if you're fancy, I guess. And then credenza just means short cabinet? Short cabinet? Okay. If you find a short cabinet anywhere and you put letters on them, we'll find it. There's only a few of them around. It'll be fine. But if you'll let us know, we'll get them to you. Miss Janice is making a box to put those in, too. You can drop them by the office. But we want Miss Kim to know how much we've appreciated her. And we look forward to her continuing to be a part of our church. We're excited for this new opportunity. All right. I'm going to invite you this morning, and Miss Jean comes down to lead us in our call to worship. If you would, uh, please stand and join with us in our call to worship. Good morning. Good morning.
making sure I had the right one. <laughs> Join me with the call to worship. God's glory is pouring forth from the heavens. Earth alone receives the good news with great joy. The promise is sure and true that Jesus has come to show us the best way to serve God. By serving and caring for others, we truly serve God. Come, let us prepare ourselves for joyful service. Lord, Lord we thank you for great service in your name. Amen. Let us pray. Leading and guiding God, you have opened the doors to us for true service. We are encouraged to become involved in ministries of peace and justice. The light of promise is reflected in your spirit, which rests in each one of us. Get us ready to serve you. Guide our lives as we learn more of what you would have us to do. Amen. Please remain standing for our opening hymn this morning, Shout to the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. So we've come to the time in our service where we pray and care for one another. And today we have something very special to celebrate. I'm going to invite Miss Kim down. But today is Promotion Sunday for our students who are getting ready. They're back in school now. We're excited for them, for their parents, for, for our community and our school system. But one of our traditions is we give a Bible to our third graders who have moved into third grade. And so we have a special Bible that's designed just for them. And so we want to give those out this morning. And I'm going to read to you the ones who are getting them this morning, whether they're here or not at this service. But Miss Anna Claire is on her way down. We're excited for her. We had Mr. Jack Walters at the early service as well. Um, Keegan, who's been coming with Miss Mary and uh, wasn't able to come here this morning. No, he's not feeling well, so we're going to shout out to Keegan, and we'll give his Bible to him next week. If that's awesome. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then Beckett Sauls, my son, um, and then also the Lambs, um, they're, they're triplets. And so, yeah, and great day. Awesome. Children's Church, and it gives really great descriptions about why, who wrote each chapter and what each chapter is about and, and why we're reading it, and it gives some good stories and backgrounds and lots of fun things at the bottom that tell you maybe about treasures and things like that that will keep in your heart for the rest of your life. So we want to give you this Bible today. This is yours to take, Anna. You're welcome. And Pastor Stephen's going to say a prayer for us. Absolutely. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for these wonderful students that you have given to us, um, those who are here this morning and those who are at home and traveling. Lord, we are so grateful for their lives, for their excitement, for Anna Claire and for all of them. Uh, Lord, we just ask that this gift of this Bible and the gift of our, our leaders and teachers who help to guide them would just be a part of your will and your in their lives. Uh, we are grateful for all that they mean to us. We are grateful for their families and just for who they are becoming. Lord, we are proud of them and we look forward to wonderful things. Lord, let these Bibles be a blessing to them and their life as they grow in faith and peace and courage and strength. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Anna Claire. I didn't know you were born in here. That's a story nobody told me. Yeah. <clears throat> I need to update me on that one. All right. But we are so grateful. Her energy is literally infectious. It's wonderful. All right, so this morning as we gather and we care for one another, one of the ways we do so is by sharing with each other the ways that we've seen God at work in the world around us. What are some of our joys? What are some of the ways that you have seen God working in this world this past week? Yeah, Terry. Terry. Awesome. Thank you, Terry. And just as a reminder at this service, because we are online, I'll repeat what goes on so it's heard by the microphones and the people at home. So Mr. Terry was giving us the update about the family that was in. They were in Madison. Is that correct, Terry? Yeah. The location, Gallatin. And um, their house burned down over the 4th of July when some fireworks set it on fire. And, um, and so we gathered clothes and money and different things, and we've made uh, large donations to them in that way. You have supported them really well. Uh, it sounds like they are sick at this moment and having to miss work. Um, which is heartbreaking, but thank you for your support. And I, I echo what Terry said, that this church is faithful and always steps up when people are in need, and even before they know people are in need, and that is truly a testament. Absolutely. What other ways have we seen God at work in the world this week? I want to say just a huge thank you as a parent to our teachers, administrators, everybody who helps to pull off the school system. I know we've been praying for them as they've gotten ready for the year. I know they are continuing to look for bus drivers to help make that happen. Um, but we are grateful. And, um, and just a little more for humorous, this is the first time in 11 years that um, we don't have any kids at home during the daytime. They're all off at school. And um, I don't know. I, I mean, I get up and go to work like I always did, but it just feels weird and glorious. Um, so, yeah. So we're excited, and we're grateful for all the teachers and, and everyone that goes into helping pull that off. It truly is a, uh, just a real service of love to our community. So I see God in that. Yeah, go ahead.
That's awesome. We're so happy for you, man. Well, congratulations. Thanks for coming and being a part of it. So are you guys from Ohio too? All right. Well, congratulations. We can't all be perfect, but we're glad you're here. Um, that's fantastic. So thank you for coming. And did your brother settle into school? Starts tomorrow. All right. We're excited for him. So that's wonderful. So we're happy to have you with us. Thanks for being here. It's wonderful. Uh, yes, Ms. Resigno. Wow. So Bill and what was the last? Bit? Bill and Becky celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary. That is amazing. 60 years. Well, way to go to Becky. She did it. All right. Well, what are the ways can we be praying for one another? What burdens can we share and help each other bear? Yes, mercy. Oh. I'm so sorry. Christy, and can you say the last name for me? Winsler. Winsler. Christy Winsler passed away this week from cancer and leaves behind just a devastated family. It was early. So sorry for your loss and for the community. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so your sister back in Memphis and um, struggling with Alzheimer's, but has had to go to the hospital and spend a couple of days there. And that is an extremely difficult time. So we'll be praying for her and for you and for the rest of the family that cares for her, too. Absolutely. Thank you, Nancy. Yes, Miss Jessica. Yes, so we're praying for Miss Lisa Lancaster's friend. Um, but he is in a step-down unit, so it sounds like he's doing better. So we'll continue to lift him up. Oh, I'm so sorry, Jennifer. So Jennifer, who's gathered with us online, praying for her brother, brother-in-law, um, who's going through treatment for lung cancer. Okay, and we'll be praying for Miss Julie and your surgery on Friday. Thank you for letting us know. Absolutely. Pastor Stephen. Yes, ma'am. I have a, um, Bob and I have a neighbor across the fence that they lost last week to cancer. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. Um, and he's a young man, and of course, uh, so uh, please be in prayer for our family at Leonard Jeffries. Leonard Jeffries, absolutely. Miss Kathy is across the fence neighbor. Mr. Leonard Jeffries, about 47, passed away from cancer, this or passed away from COVID this past week. Absolutely. Yes, Miss Emily. Oh, I'm so sorry. So Steve's going in for a checkup, but his neuropathy is not doing well. So we'll be praying for him. Absolutely. Miss Carol. Absolutely. So we have some things on the local and the national level or international level, one being uh, the people in Afghanistan continuing to pray for the unrest um, and injustice there. Also here locally from the floods. I'm just continuing to lift up the people in Waverly. The, the news reports coming through are just absolutely heart-wrenching. And um, so we're continuing to lift them up in prayer as well as to do what we can. Uh, we know that people are already showing up to help with their skilled labor machines, whatever it is they have. Again, Urban Ministries is taking um, non-perishable donations from 8 a.m. to noon all week to get ready and to take over there too. And so um, we'll be responding as we can. And if we have something else as a church, we'll get that out to you uh, via email too. Absolutely. Yes, Ms. Jean. <laughs> somebody, all right. So somebody left their phone. Yeah, when you tap the screen, is there a picture on it? You need that passcode? It's 6832. I'm just kidding. I don't know. If that works, that's going to be amazing. 
It may be. Or it may be your PIN number, Miss Jean. All right. Go ahead, Joseph. Oh, I'm so sorry. Your dad's not feeling well? We'll definitely be praying for him. All right. Well, thank you for letting us know. Absolutely. Uh, yes, ma'am. Miss Faye. I'm so sorry. You said Ms. Margie Stanley, is that correct? Okay, and she passed away from COVID this past week. We're so sorry to hear about that at Tenova. Absolutely. Well, my friends, let us take this to the Lord in prayer this morning. Let us pray. Good morning, Lord. We have come to worship this morning, bringing all that we are. Lord, we come together and there are wonderful things to celebrate. A new school year, children who are growing in wisdom and in faith and in age. That we are a church that supports them and cares for them, for our teachers and Sunday school leaders and all the people who pour their lives in. Lord, it is such a testament to you to see that even in times like these, we are continuing to train up generation after generation. Lord, we are grateful for the ways that you have cared for us. We have seen you at work in the sunshine we have seen you in people being healed and those who have experienced peace in the moments of unrest. Lord, we know that you are with us as we celebrate anniversaries and birthdays and the goodness of life. But Lord, we also bring to you this morning some of the more difficult parts. We look around our world and we see unrest and injustice in places like Afghanistan and scattered around this world. We ask that you be in those places, that you be with those people that you bring, bring peace and understanding and justice, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, we ask that you hear our prayer. Lord, we specifically lift up to you this morning just the absolute tragedy of flash flooding in our own community, specifically those in Humphreys County and in Waverly. Lord, they need a special dose of your care. They need to see your loving peace and presence in the eyes of strangers who have come to help. Lord, help us to be a people who pull together what we have so that those who have lost so much can have just a little bit of their dignity and their help and their help restored. Lord, we ask that you be with them. You be with the first responders who will be working 24 hours a day for the foreseeable future. Lord, we are grateful for their lives. We are grateful that their families can make room for them to help people who have experienced such loss. Lord, be with their schools, their communities, their hospitals their homes, their people. Lord, just help them. Lord, we also bring to you this morning our, our own grief. People that we have loved have been lost, and we know that in you they are found. But to us, we still mourn, and we still hurt, and we still see their loved ones in pain. So we ask for your peace. We ask for your presence in our lives. And even in the lack of understanding, we just ask that you be with us during these difficult times now and the ones that lie ahead. Lord, for those who are sick, we lift them up to you this morning and we ask for your healing presence, that you would be with them and heal them, help them to recuperate from their surgeries and everything else that has gone on. Lord, we know that you are the great physician and we, we want to remind you, as you already know, that you are needed in this world and that we want to be your people, to be your help, to be your presence and your love. So this morning, Lord, we ask you to make us look like your son, Jesus, to be a servant, to have compassion and empathy. And may we take another step on that journey this week as we pray the prayer that he taught us as we join our voices together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we invite our children. If you would like to go with Miss Kim to Children's Church, you can. Children are always welcome in our worship service. 
But if you would like, there is a time designed with song and craft and a special lesson just for them, and they can head out of the sanctuary with Miss Kim at this time. Beautiful. Thank you very much. We're going to share to je- together today from John chapter 13, and we're going to read a set of scriptures together. So hear the word of the Lord this morning. Before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that his time had come to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were, his own who were in the world, he loved them fully. Jesus and his disciples were sharing the evening meal. The devil had already provoked Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the table and took off his robes. Picking up a linen towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he was wearing. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but you will understand it later. No, Peter said, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you will not have a place with me. Simon Peter said, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus responded, those who have bathed need only to have their feet washed. Because they are completely clean. You disciples are clean, but not every one of you. He knew who would betray him. That's why he said, not every one of you is clean. After he washed the disciples' feet, he put on his robes and returned to his place at the table. 
He said to them, Do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you speak correctly because I am. If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you too must wash each other's feet. I have given you an example. Just as I have done, you also must do. I assure you, servants aren't greater than their master, nor are those who are sent greater than the one who sent them. Since you know these things, you will be happy if you do them. I'm not speaking about all of you. I know those whom I've chosen, but this is to fulfill the scripture. The one who eats my bread has turned against me. I'm telling you this now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am. I assure you that whoever receives someone I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we're in the midst of a series called Marks of Discipleship, and we have been answering the seemingly simple question, what does a disciple look like? If we're going to make disciples for the transformation of the world, and we're going to love God and love people and make this world a better place, then what does it look like to be a disciple? So we've been trying to take this this holistic topic of what Holy Scripture, what our experience of God, what our traditions in the church mean about how we're supposed to be a disciple. And if we remember, disciples don't stay disciples forever. Disciples become apostles. See, a lot of times in the church we've gotten it wrong because we've treated disciple to mean learner. And learning is a part of being disciples. But disciples grow up. And they, st- they get off the milk, so to speak, and they move on to solid food, as Paul shared in Hebrews. We read that a few Sundays ago. And they become the apostles, the one who are sent, the ones who then do, the ones who live as Jesus' presence in the world. And that is who we are trying to be. So not just learners in knowledge, but people who take knowledge and who turn it into action and life and a whole state of being as a person to where we look as much like Jesus Christ in action and in thought and in deed as we possibly can. So we've been trying to answer the question, what does it look like then to be a disciple? So we've distilled it down into just a few points that we believe we can take forward, and we've been working through them over the course of the last few weeks. So the first week we said, disciples worship. And we defined worship as we find traditionally in Holy Scripture that worship is about experiencing and praising God. So we said, how do we experience and how do we praise God? Now, we do that when we gather together here, but if worship is only one hour in these physical walls, then I believe we're selling ourselves short. We're called to worship all throughout our week. And we don't mean you have a miniature church service at your house. If you want to do that, you can. But we can worship in our cars as we drive to work listening to music. We can worship when we're interacting with other people and helping to serve the needy in our community. I believe that we can worship in all kinds of ways, through reading scripture, through being a part of a Bible study, through sitting on our porch and seeing the sunrise and the birds coming out, through seeing the sunsets, through having a dinner together as a family. There are all kinds of ways that we can experience God and that we can praise God, even in the midst of everything that goes on in our life. So when we talk about worship, we've got two things that we believe disciples do. One, they come together for corporate worship. They support the church by being a part of worship. They make it a priority in their life, like a mission outpost, to be shaped, to be inspired, hopefully, and to be sent out into their week, where they will find a way to then worship each and every day, and hopefully begin to find ways to worship all throughout the day in various ways and various forms. And so I want to ask you, you you're already here, so you got, you got one check mark already. You've made it to worship together. But I then want to ask you and challenge you to take your next step in faith. How do you worship every other day of the week? What does it look like to you? Maybe it's podcasts or music. Maybe it's devotional readings. Maybe it's praying with your spouse or with your children. I don't know what it looks like, but you need to answer that question because that is a mark of what it is to be a disciple. Disciples don't just attend church once a week and then forget about it the rest of the week. So how are you going to proactively worship every other day of the week. Secondly, we said that disciples grow, that God created the things that God created, they grow. We see all of these, these scriptures that talk about we are the vine and you are the, or you are the vine and we are the branches, that we are like a tree that grows and bears good fruit. And if it doesn't bear fruit, if it doesn't grow, then we cut it back and we get rid of it. We as disciples are people who grow. 
So you may already be attending worship, but our next question for you is, how are you growing in your faith? Are you a part of a small group or a Bible study? How are you being held accountable for growth in your faith, for continuing to take the truths of Scripture and of worship and your experience of God and and what you're hearing when you pray? And how are you applying that to your life? Do you have people in your life that you talk with that about? Your spouse, your friends, your coworkers, whatever it may be. Because we are called to grow And not just in knowledge. You see, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, so I won't dive too deep into it. But that is a place where the modern church, especially in North America, has really gotten it wrong. Being a disciple is not about having all the knowledge. Now, we want to learn. We want to read Scripture and to memorize it and to learn all we can about the, the stories of Christ, the stories of our matriarchs and patriarchs of faith. It is good to learn those things. But knowing them and doing them are two separate things. Knowing them and having them integrated into your life so that you live the way that Jesus would live in every moment that you're in, that is the point of faith. Not just knowing the stories, but living them out the way that they would be lived now. The way that Jesus would have us to live. So is the knowledge good? Absolutely. But the knowledge is not the point. Having a life full of faith and of grace is the point. The disciples didn't cry out, Lord, give us knowledge. The disciples cried out, Lord, give us faith. So we want to be a people who constantly grow in faith. And so you're here in worship, but I want to ask you to take that next step. Are you involved in the Bible study? Are you involved in a prayer group? Are you involved in an accountability group or a reunion group or whatever you might call it? Are you involved in a Sunday school class? Because that's a step in faith you need to take. That's a step in faith that we see modeled by Jesus and the disciples. That's a step in faith that we find all throughout Holy Scriptures and the traditions of our church. Where are we growing and how are we growing? Because you're not going to haphazardly end up there. You're going to end up there because you have a plan and because you're intentional about your faith life. And thirdly, last week we talked about how disciples are generous We walked through very briefly John Wesley's words about we earn all we can, we save all we can, we give all we can. And here's where we wanted to kind of plant that is that disciples work just as hard at being generous as they do at earning. It's not wrong to go out and to have a job and to earn and to quest after that as long as it's not for the love of money and status and all of the negative things that go along with that. But we are also a generous people. Terry just testified to that, that we came together for a family we've never even met before. So I want us to hear that as a pat on the back this morning. But I also wanted to hear that, that this is a way that we support the church, a way that we support our community, that disciples are people who are generous, generous with their empathy and their compassion, generous with their listening ear and their shoulder to cry on. Generous with their resources, with the skills of their hands, with the knowledge they have accumulated over the years. Disciples are a people who see needs and who meet them, whether they're spiritual or emotional or mental or physical. It's so easy to focus on the physical needs, and those are important. People have physical needs, and we as a church, as a people of Christ, are called to help meet those. But there are other needs to be met as well, and we need to make sure we're in tune with them. Disciples worship. Disciples grow. How are you worshiping every day? How are you growing every day? Disciples are generous. How are you generous every day? So today we're going to dive into this fourth uh, kind of step and what it looks like to be a disciple. And, um, and I was noticing as I went out this week, we're not seeing as many of these now, but if you remember, if you've gone to a restaurant, especially like a fast food place or something like that, if you've seen the sign that's like, please bear with us in case the service is bad, we can't find anybody to, to be a server. Have y'all seen those signs? You know what I'm talking about? You hear about it on the news. It's touted everywhere, right, for, for various reasons, but without getting into the aspects that the news are promoting or not promoting, I've seen them everywhere. And, and I wanted to ask, has anybody ever worked in food service before? Yeah, yeah. Is anybody, anybody raise your hand again. Is anybody still working in food service? Why not? Because it's terrible, right? And I don't mean that negatively as in people who work there are bad. Not like that at all. I mean, it's hard work. It's difficult work. And, uh, and one of the parts that's really the most difficult is because is it's all about people. And I don't know if you've met people, but people are hard, right? It's just the truth. And so I wanted to ask you this morning, why do you think it's hard to find 
servers, to find people who are willing to be servants. Because as I read that, I read, I was like, it's hard to find people who are willing to serve. And that's true on a larger scale than just Burger King and Strawberry Alley. It's hard to find people who are willing to serve. Why is it that people don't want to serve? That was not rhetorical. I'm actually asking. Yeah, go ahead. There's easier things to do. Absolutely. We'll need you to make a list of those for us. Because they, say that again. They don't get paid much. Absolutely. So if you're thinking about servers in particular, the hourly wage is like two seventeen, dollars and then plus tips. But here's some truth, church people. Every server I've ever talked to, you know their least favorite shift of the week? Sunday morning. And why is that? Because the church people don't tip. Go ahead. I'm stepping on your toes on purpose. If you can't afford to tip, you can't afford to eat out. Right? These people are working hard. Right? And that's hard to hear for us. But if we are going to be a people that are generous, and people look at the church and think perhaps they're not, here's something as simple as this one meal in the afternoon that helps prove their point. And I would love for us to be a people who prove the opposite. That's right. Why else? Why else is it hard to find people to be servants? Go ahead, Terry. They don't want to deal with unruly customers. Absolutely. Ungodly hours. That's a good point. We, we always joked, you know, if you grew up in the church and you went through youth ministry, they would always say when students get their keys, they, they stop attending church, and that's not, that hasn't been true for a couple of decades. It's not the keys. It's when they get a job, they stop attending church because the job always tells them, yeah, you can have Wednesdays and Sundays off, no problem. Very next set of shifts come out, pff, they don't care anymore because they got you. And retail hours, especially food service hours, if you think about that specifically, when everybody else is not working, you're working, right? Why else? Why else is it hard to find people not just to be servers but to be servants? Bad hours. Terry, what was it you said again? Unruly customers. Yeah, it's full of people. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, being outside of your own comfort zone. Sometimes serving others is it's kind of uncomfortable. Yeah, Jessica. Lack of appreciation. Not a lot of gratitude in that. I asked for ketchup seven minutes ago. I had to eat half these delicious fries without ketchup, right? My grandfather, I'm, I'm, I'm not, well, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not actually guilty, but because I saw it go badly. My grandfather was terrible to waiters and waitresses. I remember in a restaurant, he would hold his glass up and whack it till they came over to fill it up. Like, I, I, like I, I would have a visceral reaction, and I would go, I was even a small child, and I would be like, I'm so sorry. I can't, like, I feel, I'm so sorry. If I had money, I would give it to you. You know, do you like rocks? I have some of those in my pockets. But other than that, yeah. All right, so usually there's a lack of gratitude. It is hard to find servants. And I don't mean just servers in the food service industry. That's what's being pointed out at this moment. But there's a reason they don't want to come back to work. And, and you may be saying, oh, that's because of unemployment benefits or whatever. But I want to tell you that if a few hundred bucks separates you from your job, I don't think you like that job anyway. Right? There's a reason. It's because serving is underpaid. There's not a lot of gratitude. You have to deal with people. Right? And people always overestimate their own worth and value. It's hard. It's hard work. Now, as you see in the church, we say servant a lot. A lot. And I'm curious how we go about modeling that out in the world. So we say it in the church, and we say it in a, pro a positive sense. We want to be servants. We want to serve. But then a lot of these same things still apply. It's not always, there's not always a whole lot of gratitude. There's not a lot of pay. We joke with the volunteers. Yeah, we'll double your salary if you do that. Well, two times zero is zero, right? And whether we're serving out in the community, sometimes we get accolades for those things. Many times we don't. It is hard to be a servant. But one of the truths we find in Scripture, one of the truths we find in this, this life that Jesus has called us to, 
is that it's greater to serve than to be served. And that the last will finish first and the first will finish last. And that even the master serves. Right? I love this, this moment here in this foot washing story. And, and looking in John 13, starting with verse 3, it says, Jesus knew the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Now, I want you to catch the significance of this. This is one of the things I think we scan over, and it's easy to scan over. But if you remember back to the temptation, we talked about it several weeks ago. But the devil takes Jesus up on the mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. and says, you can have all of this. You can have everything. All you have to do is worship me. And Jesus responds, no, no, I'm not going to do that, right? But here in this moment, Jesus has been given everything. It's happened. It says, Jesus knew the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Jesus had everything. Jesus could snap his fingers and poof, go be in heaven. Jesus could just do what needed to be done. And here in this moment, when Jesus has everything, right, like if you want to see somebody's true colors, let them win the lottery, right? Because when they have everything, then they can actually do what they want to do. They don't have to worry about a job. They don't have to worry about where the next meal is coming from. Whatever it is, they can actually be the people that they want to be. Now, maybe that means they go to Antigua. Maybe that means they buy a Lamborghini. I don't know what it means you do. But here, and what it means to be like Jesus, when you have been given everything, Jesus strips down to nothing, humiliating in front of his friends, wraps a tablecloth linen around himself, and goes and begins washing feet. Now, when I was at my my first church, I was working as a youth director. We were getting ready for Holy Week. And of course, all the staff and all the the volunteers participate in Holy Week. And our our pastor at the time, she had some, some serious medical conditions. She was actually in the hospital. And I think by her way of participating, she sent back this big booklet, like whole thing of everything we were going to do as a part of Holy Week. And everything she sent back for us to do on Holy Week probably rivaled what they were doing at the Vatican. Like we were going to have a service every day of the week with all of this high holy stuff that we had never even done before. And, but I remember specifically reading down all of the instructions, and it got to Monday, Thursday. And this is where we typically read this scripture from here today about the foot washing. We get to Monday, Thursday, and it said, we're going to have a foot washing station. And I remember I snickered a little bit under my breath because I knew our associate would be the one who had to wash feet. And I was like, ha, ha, ha. His name was Wiley. He can never remember anybody's name. He just called you sport or champ. But anyway, nobody else thinks that's funny. Just me and you, Nileen. All right. So, <clears throat> and then I got down the list, and they were going to have four stations. And two of them up at the front right here like this is where it would have been were going to be me and Wiley, and we were going to be washing feet. And the two other ladies who were on staff, they were going to be over here at the edges, and they were going to be washing hands. And I thought, that's ridiculous. I hate feet. I'm just going to tell you up front, it's the truth. I'm glad that you have feet, and I don't wish you ill will because you have them. But I don't like feet. And I was reading this thing, and I was like, I'm going to have to touch all these people's feet. I'm going to have to see them and wash them and touch them, and I'm going to be close enough to smell them, if we're going to be honest, right? Like, we even put special stuff in the water so that it smelled really nice, this pomegranate oil stuff, and that was just purely self-serving. So they came down front, and we were starting, and they were, like, down here at the aisle, and, and they were getting ready to come up front, and they were lining up, and these people were, like, pulling their socks off, and there was just, like, <sighs> lint and just stuff. It was just gross. Most of them needed a pedicure. I haven't personally had one, but I hear that most of them need one. Maybe you do too. I don't know. And it was disgusting. I'm going to be honest with you. I was looking at this line of people and this line of feet, realizing how much I didn't like feet, and they were just sitting there coming this way. And I remember thinking, I should have quit last week. (laughs) Right? Like, I can't quit now. I got a whole year that will be fine until we get to this again. I should have quit last week. But that night, we had a beautiful service. And these people came down, and what I found out after we talked to them, we had a little dinner thing afterwards. Of course, everybody watched to make sure Wiley and I went and washed our hands before we came out there. But we were talking to them, and they were so embarrassed. They were humiliated to come down front with their feet. We actually had people who threatened to leave the church 
because we made them take their shoes and socks off in church. And we didn't make them take them off. They chose to participate, right? But they were mad because it took humility to even have their feet washed, a little bit like Simon Peter. You're not going to wash my feet. But they came down, and we poured water, and we laid our hands on them, and we rubbed them around, and we, we prayed for them, for that individual person, each and every one that came down until they had all come down, and they all went to sit back down. And it was one of the most beautiful services of the year. And something I still remember, and I joke about it, about not liking feet. But it was also extremely meaningful for everyone who participated. You see, Jesus gave us this model of when we have everything. We put it all on the line. Our bodies, whatever it is, and service to others. And we typically like to hoard and, and to think about ourselves and our own comfort or preferences or rights or whatever it is, right? We don't like to think about giving that up for anyone else. We seem to have gotten more selfish generationally as we go on, or at least thinking of the self first before we get to others. But Jesus calls us to a different life. What you do for the least of these, you've done for me. The first will be last. We like the last being first. And we like to say that when we come in last. But when we're coming in first, I don't really hear people quote, the first will be last. Because we want to be first. We don't really want to be last. But if we are going to experience God, if we are going to help others experience God, then in those places where they need service the most, even though it makes them humiliated, not because we're forcing it on them, because that's the circumstances they're in, and we can offer them some dignity. We can offer them some aid. We can offer them some help. You see, Jesus didn't lose his place. I hope you caught that in here. He goes and he washes their feet, and then he returns to his place. He didn't give up being the master, but the master became the servant. No matter our status, no matter whatever it is in our life, we are called to be servants. And it doesn't mean we give up of who we are unless that's something we believe God is calling us to. But it means that no matter who we are, we should be servants. We should serve each other. You see, I believe service starts at home. And I believe we find that in the Holy Scripture. Service starts at home. I was thinking about when Nikki and I got married. And um, people always talk about how great the first year of marriage is. But I always like to remind couples when we're doing counseling, the first year of marriage is usually one of the hardest. And um, that's the way it is for most people that I've counseled with or talked to. And, uh, and I remember Nikki and I, we were married a few weeks, and I, I came home, and she was crying. And I said, what are you crying about? And she said, that sounded really rude. I meant, why are you crying, sweetheart? <laughs> <clears throat> what are you crying about? Well, now she's crying about that, right? And she just, she was crying and tears in her eyes. She's like, it's so hard living with a boy. And I was like, I know, I got two younger brothers. They're numbskulls. You know, I know. Anyway. But in all seriousness, so we had to go through, we were having trouble defining out the roles of what it would look like and who would do what in the house. And I remember we took a, a sheet of notebook paper, we drew a line down the middle, and we put one name on one side and her name on one side and my name on the other, and we went back and forth. And it was like, I, I'll do the dishes if you'll do the laundry. And we'd be like, yes or no, and we'd check it off. And then be like, well, I'll do the vacuum and if you'll do the yard, or I'll do this if you'll do this, and yada, yada, yada. We actually went down tit for tat and did this whole thing. And it worked pretty well for a little while, but eventually we kind of came to resent each other and started checking, well, you didn't do your box today or whatever it was, right? And I did my boxes, and you didn't do this, and da, 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 And I was talking to an older gentleman that I was in a small group with at the church, and I said, you know, what do we do? And uh, he said, how are you serving your wife? And I was like, that doesn't sound right. I already don't like this conversation. And, um, and he was like, no, what, what are you doing that isn't on the list? And I was like, well, I really don't like this now. He said, what if you did something, just one thing, and you didn't even tell her about it? You just did it just to help her. What would that look like? And I thought, oh, man, that looks like a lot of work, what that looks like. So I decided I'm going to make coffee and breakfast every morning. I'm just going to get up, and I'm not going to say anything about it. And I, in my mind, I was like, for a year, I'm going to make coffee and breakfast every morning. I think I made coffee every morning for a year. I think the breakfast thing made it a few months, to be honest, right? But I did this thing, and, it, and what changed was not that it changed her, but it changed my perception. It changed me. It made me stop thinking about 
Was I getting what I was due? Was everything being done that was on my list, that was on her list that she was supposed to do, right? And it made me start thinking about how could I bless her? How could I serve her? How could I honor her? What would that look like? And so I ask you today, how are you serving in your home? Whether it's assisted living or a freestanding home or an apartment complex or whether you live with people or even if it's just you, right? How can we begin serving at home? And maybe we expand that a little bit to our neighbors. Y'all know we, it's, it's, it's great to brag on some of the people we have here, but y'all have all met Miss May, right? She's about yay tall. And in all seriousness, she mows eight or ten yards. Did y'all know that? She mows. She's, she's cut back a little bit when it's been this hot during the summer, but she mows other people's grass. She takes her little subcompact hybrid thing and she puts her lawnmower in the back or if they have a lawnmower, she goes over. She mows other people's grass. She serves. She comes and she teaches Sunday school. We have so many wonderful people. You are some of those wonderful people that serve in such amazing ways. Service starts at home. Sometimes you hear about people in the community and they're just wonderful pillars of the community. They just, they just do so much, whether it's in government or business or whatever it is, and then you meet your, their family, and their family doesn't really like them. Because see, sometimes we focus on serving outside of the home before we start at home. Service starts at home. Then we serve each other. You know, the, the Resignos back here, as well as Ms. Pat Smith, Resignos joined just a couple of weeks ago. Ms. Pat joined this coming week. The, the shoe hearts that are getting ready to join in just a few weeks. We make a commitment to each other during that time. We ask you when you join, we say, hey, will you support the church? Will you support the church around the world with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? And they say, we will. And then we as a congregation, we get up and we say, we will love you. We will care for you. We will support you, your children, whatever it is. Because your service then starts with our extended family here in the church. We love and care for one another. We serve each other here through participating in worship, through taking meals to shut-ins, through going and visiting, through whatever it is, through teaching Sunday school for adults, for youth, for children. There are so many ways. We, we pack fuel bags. We get Operation Christmas Child stuff together. We do all kinds of things, right? We're supposed to be supporting each other here, and this is one of the places where we serve. And we also serve in the community because a servant cares for the world. A servant isn't servant first. A servant sees the world and what it needs and meets those needs. And those needs change. And sometimes we have to as well. When we look around this world, I want you to ask yourself, what does the world need that I might have? And sometimes that's a check. Don't get me wrong. But I think most often it's actually caring. I think is the first thing that the world needs. Actually listening to the people who are crying out and saying they need care instead of listening to the pundits who tell you about the people who are crying out needing care. What if we listened? What if we had a heart that was full of compassion first and judgment last? What if we knew less instead of always knowing it all first? What if we went into our relationships with new people with the heart of a servant instead of the heart of just what normal humans have? If you remember, Jesus says, they will know you are Christian by your love for one another. How are we loving this world? We believe it together. We teach it and support it here in the church. But then we got to go out in the world and we got to do it. We got to live it. Sometimes that's as simple as what we tip at the next meal we eat. But sometimes it requires more, and thank God that it does. Because that's when life will begin to be transformed for you. You see, when we begin to put it all on the line and to serve the way that Jesus served, I believe Jesus is going to meet us in those places. Whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. And here in our scripture today, he says, whoever receives someone I send receives me. Whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. 
If you're looking for an experience of God, I would encourage you. You can read scripture. You can pray. Please do those things. But find someone to serve. Find somewhere to serve. That can be here at the church. That can be at Manic Cafe or Urban Ministries or Loaves and Fishes. That can be at Book Buddies at the local school. Uh, that can be in all kinds of ways and of places, through, through the VA, uh, going to nursing homes. I don't know what your skills are. Maybe you can juggle. People like to watch people juggle. It's weird. I don't get it, but people do. There are all kinds of talents and skills and things that you might have and ways that you can serve. And I believe, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, that this life we have been given, it's not our own. We are managers, not owners. And there's going to be an accounting. There's going to be an audit, so to speak. I believe God is going to ask us, what did we do with everything that we were given? And when we work just as hard giving it away through service to others as we did earning it, I think we're going to hear something that we find so precious in Scripture. When we arrive in heaven, what is it that we hope to hear? Who can tell me? Well done, good and faithful servant. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for calling us to serve. Lord, it's not easy, and it's not glamorous, and it doesn't get me everything that I want. But I, I want to be like you. We want to be like you. We want to experience you. We want to love you with everything we have, love the people around us with everything we have. And we want to make this world a better place. Lord, give us faith. Give us grace and compassion and empathy. Move us to action. Help us to not just be disciples, but to be apostles. And Lord, help us to be servants. In your son's name I pray. Amen. It's without asking God into our hearts and without saying, here I am, Lord, use me. Please stand for our last hymn this morning, Here I Am, Lord. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save, I who made stars of night I will make their darkness bright who will bear my light to them whom shall I send here I am Lord is it I Lord I have heard you calling in the night I will snow and rain. I have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them. They turn away. I will break their hearts of stone. Give them hearts for love alone. I will speak my word to them. Whom shall I 
I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. Go from here to be a servant. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.